Is politics about debate, deliberation, argumentation, or about passions, emotions, feelings? In this episode of Speaking Otherwise, I, Prathama, speak to the literary theorist Uday Kumar on the place of affect in our contemporary public life. Uday's work, right from his first book, The Joycean Labyrinth, to his next book, Writing the First Person, has struggled with questions of self, body, affect, dispositions, the permeability between what is called the interior of the human entity and the exterior, the worldly. His work helps us engage with the burning contemporary question of affect and passions in everyday public life in India and indeed the world today. Welcome to there. Thank you, Prathama. I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. Yeah, looking forward to it. Let me say directly uh, get into the most obvious question that's on everybody's mind, which is that recent politics has seen high passions playing out globally and in India forcing us to pay attention to questions of emotional affect. So what does this entail for humanities scholarship in general and literary theory in particular? Yes, uh, you're right. Um, I think there is quite a bit of discussion now all over the world about the new prominence of passions in the political field. Uh, and there seem to be two kinds of passions, you could say. One is the more aggressive kind, which, make people, uh, which makes people more active and engaged. Like for instance, um, uh, emotions like hatred or rage, you know, which make people do things aggressively. And then there are another set of emotions which, are, uh, which we do not usually associate with politics, which are like uh, grief, uh, quiet, uh, resoluteness, which is not so much uh, uh, loud in its articulation, and also a kind of visibilization of situations of helplessness, uh, like humiliation, for instance, or stigmatization, destitution. This prominence of passions anyway seem to require some new tools for thinking about politics. This is partly because we think of passion as directly opposed to action. Uh, etymologically, they are exactly the opposite. Passion is more like suffering when you are acted upon rather than acting. But the problem of passion is not entirely new to the question of politics because we know that right from the inception of politics in the Western world, the question of uh, demagoguery uh, was a concern. Uh, the ability of people to whip up passions among the people. Uh, but however, this way of thinking about passions is limited. It does not really solve the problem because it actually speaks about uh, an agential act that of whipping up the passions, but it does not quite account for how we are affected by this, how people get swayed by this. In other words, there is no clear account of the permeability of political subjectivity. So earlier, one used to think about it, especially in a liberal political frame in modern times, one tends to think about it as a kind of product of ignorance, as caused by ignorance. So education might actually remedy this propensity of people to be swayed by political passions. But we know that that's not actually true because in our own times, uh, even in countries like India, for instance, you see a lot of people who are very well educated uh, being equally permeable to the whipping up of passions or political passions. You know? So uh, arguments, uh, what we call true facts or true news, education, these seem not to be able uh, to touch that dimension of our political subjectivity that is swayed by this turbulence of the, the world of passion. You know? Another problem is that 
the paradigm of education also kind of thinks about the remedy as uh, lying in the domain of individuation. Like you cultivate an individual self who is more robust against a kind of collective play of passions. Whereas that may not really be the, the way in which uh, one can intervene in the field of passions, not by getting out of it, but by looking close into it and finding out what would be the way in which one can inflect it. So all these are actually uh, questions which point to the need for looking more closely at our status as sites of the operation of a political substance which cannot be contained or regulated by a dominant liberal understanding of politics. Uh, so um, here, uh, uh, from the point of view of humanities or literary studies, uh, the way in which we encounter this problem is I would say in relationship to the paradigm of narration, because we, you know that um, uh, in literary studies in particular, and I would say from the 1970s, uh, this propensity also spread to other disciplines in the humanities like history, for instance. Think about Hayden White's meta history, you know, which, which came out in the 70s. Then 80s and 90s, this becomes more pronounced where we think about narration as the kind of principal paradigm for understanding um, uh, coherent articulation. You know? uh, in the case of literature, of course, uh, it is really a focus on implotment, you know, the idea of plot. Uh, and because plot is really uh, about purposive action, how events are actually connected in terms of a certain sequence of purposiveness. Yeah? Uh, so action uh, and purposive connections become central to the idea of employment. Uh, this, in literary studies, this goes back, of course, to Aristotle, you know, who, uh, and Aristotle is a major influence in the, in the rethinking and the new prominence of narrative in literary studies in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but if you look closely at Aristotle, you will see that there is a problem because on the one hand, Aristotle, of course, privileges the idea of plot. He provides the first major elaboration of uh, what you may call literary fabrication, you know, and places it in relationship to plot. But at the same time, we also know that his real aim was to give some kind of account of how tragic emotions are produced, yeah? Because he's, you know, the question as to what is a good tragic plot is really about what kind of plot do you require as an accessory, as an instrument for producing tragic emotions? Yeah. So uh, you could say that uh, there is a different way of reading the question of plot in relationship to Aristotle's account if we give prominence to the question of emotions there. Then plot or narration really becomes like a kind of uh, framework or a kind of space from which you witness this event of the explosion of emotions, yeah? Uh, it is not really a kind of grid of intelligibility of the emotions as such, but a kind of framework created by action from which you can actually witness it. You can uh, see it, participate in it, you know? Uh, so it is this latter side which I think uh, we probably are looking more closely at in literary studies and probably other humanities studies as well. I would also say that consequently, uh, there has been a shift from the earlier practice of critical reading, which, you know, critical reading here, I'm using it in a very specific sense. The idea that literary reading was essentially aimed at demystifying and bringing out into the open that which is hidden by the operations of narration, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are many critics who actually move away from that to look at other aspects of reading, which probably bring it closer to certain non-literary practices like uh, the recitation of religious texts, the shouting of slogans, the uh, uh, petitioning prayers, you know? So, 
you get a wider set of textual practices which are not really fully understandable in terms of purposive action and its protocols, but also in the way in which you allow yourself to be carried along, allow yourself to be subsumed by a certain force which you, uh, which you permit to be operating in the field around you. you know? mm. so, so this is my first response to this question of how a literary uh, a student would actually respond to this prominence of passions in public life. Right? It involves a search for new tools and new forms of attention, I would say. Yeah, that that's 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 anticipates in some way what I was going to ask uh, uh, na next, which is that in your earlier work, which is writing the first person, your emphasis is actually pretty much on the self and narration of the self. Uh, and in what you are saying now, you are making a kind of self-conscious move, it seems to me. Uh, from the question of the self and the question of narration to the question of permeability of the self or the lack of coherence of the self as such or, or a, kind of, uh, a kind of boundary around the self and the ability of the self to be placed in a coherent narrative to the domain of effect and affect of a, a, a kind of expression, of any mode of expression, uh, be it a slogan or a, a chant or whatever. So if you can say a little more about this analytical move between from the self slash narration to affect slash effect, collectivity, I don't know what, I mean, something to that team. Thank you, thank you for this question. Uh, you know, my um, first kind of uh, work in uh, academic scholarship was actually a, um, a doctoral thesis on um, the fiction of James Joyce. And uh, James Joyce was uh, traditionally seen as um, a stream of consciousness novelist, you know, who was all about uh, interiority, you know, devising new tools for exploring interiority. Uh, uh, my work was really um, about how Joyce's uh, fictional strategies were aimed rather at creating a kind of technique of exteriority, in the sense that um, they are not merely connected with structures of language, but also structures of use of language, the entire history of all these uh, words and utterances which are marked by the way people use them. And they are made to circulate in the text in a fairly self-conscious, but also sometimes anarchic way. And these characters and their interiority seem to be produced at some points as effects of this. There are very, very fascinating uh, details of this kind of exteriorization, which undermines any notion of stable interiority. So, so I was interested in this connection between the proposal to look into interiority and uh, imploding it in some sense by uh, uh, bringing in, taking into it all that is outside it by way of history, by way of the use of words, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I, I suggested that this also results in um, a somewhat different conception of what we call tradition. That, that, that was the kind of work I was trying to do. Now, when I began this uh, work writing the first person um, many, many years ago, I was actually trying to understand uh, the major changes, an aspect of the major changes which happened in places like Kerala, uh, which is not unique, you know, it's uh, true about many other parts of India, uh, many other parts of the world in the 19th century and uh, the early part of the 20th century, which we usually designate with the concept of modernity. Yeah. Now, the problem with, you know, the problem I faced was this, because on the one hand, 
The term modernity was ubiquitous. It was heavily overdetermined by the various uses to which it was put, often uh, made to respond to very, very different questions in different places. Yeah? But on the other hand, it was also a very imprecise term mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because the term modernity itself is in some sense, especially at that time, caught up, uh, caught between two kinds of views. On the one hand, it seems to be used as a descriptive term uh, as part of a typology of different kinds of societies, um, uh, referring to some features, you could say. But at the same time, there is no precise set of features which would enable you to identify modernity. And on the other hand, it was also referring to a kind of form of time consciousness about the present, about a certain sense of rupture that defines the present. Yeah? So there was this problem of overdetermination and imprecision at the same time about the notion of modernity. So I thought probably one way of moving forward would be to keep the uh, conceptual apparatus of modernity outside my inquiry, out of my inquiry, and uh, avoid the burden of the uses to which that term had already been put, and to look at something more limited and modest, something specific, which I thought one possible way would be to look at the changes which happened in the way people speak about themselves and their lives, yeah? So in that sense, uh, my uh, project was really to look at the changes in the articulation of what you may call self-relationship, you know, a relationship uh, which may be called a self-relationship, which usually manifests in what I call uh, I statements, so first-person statements, which have a kind of uh, reliance on uh, the first-person pronoun I. And, and I had uh, naively thought that uh, autobiographies would be the right place to look for it, uh, because that seems to be the self-avowed genre of the first-person narration. But after I began looking at it, it became very clear that these I statements are not really produced in the autobiographical genre. They come from many other places. And then, as you know, the book became about uh, uh, spiritual writing, about society, uh, and uh, monologic poetry, about the novel, about historical novel, and then, of course, autobiography. But what the book did not really do enough, probably, you know, was that this inquiry can be extended into the non-literary as well. There are some signs of that in the book in its preoccupation with uh, petitioning you know, and uh, uh, testimony, the mode of the testimony, but it certainly can be extended in those directions where people, uh, people's way of speaking about themselves, so people's modes of self-relationship are actually changed or inflected by new institutional demands, new procedural demands, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So my interest has been to look at uh, first person accounts, not really as expressions of a self, but as the site of the production of what I call self-relationship. Self-relationship is not really a relationship to the self as an object, but a kind of reflexive relationship which constitutes a subject back as an object of its own actions or inquiries yeah, or yeah, uh, yeah. articulations, you could say, yeah? But uh, what the book eventually ended up showing uh, uh, was a kind of lack of fit or incoherence uh, in this relationship, which often indicated a difficulty in inhabiting normative frames of selfhood. So the reading of the autobiographies themselves were actually an attempt to show that there is often autobiographies are a kind of uh, inadvertent visibilization or staging of this lack of fit or instability uh, uh, or incoherence in the, in the project of uh, describing a self or charting the evolution of a self. Yeah? So I found this particularly uh, in the manifestation of certain postures of the subject, uh, which are associated with unease, embarrassment, you know, uh, sometimes regret. You know. so, so this is actually the, the place where uh, there is an attempt to 
engage with something which is not at the order of narration, but at a, at a threshold which is lower than that, which is not adequately captured by it. It is, it is not uh, fully developed there, except probably in the discussions of uh, poetry and the historical novel, probably it is uh, better developed. But the preoccupation with the question of uh, emotions really uh, was opened up by this problems of what I have tried to call problems of inhabitation. You know? uh, it is that difficulty of inhabitation which really uh, preoccupied me. And in my more recent work, I am trying to look at it more closely, you know, like uh, uh, the work I, I have been doing on uh, some of these narratives of uh, uh, possession, spirit possession, uh, uh, like the work of C.I. Yepen, et cetera, really are actually inquiries into this problem of inhabitation, uh, which is not merely a kind of problem of the individual self, but something which uh, is really about the threshold of the individual, you could say, you know, the, the kind of edges of the individual, yeah? Uh, so uh, in that sense, if, if one may uh, say so, my concern is less with the concept of the self as with that space of speech and experience, which literary studies inevitably gets preoccupied by. You know? mm. So, so uh, in that sense, how does this reformulation, uh, taking the question of affect seriously and, and the question of the lack of fit uh, in the uh, self-relation, how does it change the concept of experience itself? I ask this also because experience has been such an important uh, concept in like feminist politics, black politics, Dalit politics. So is there something changing yeah. there subtly? Yeah, it, it's, a, uh, it's a difficult and complex question because um, the, uh, there has been, as, as you uh, know, a lot of debate about the concept of experience. Right. And, uh, 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 which are often linked to questions of authenticity, mm -hmm. identity, uh, and on the other hand, sometimes people pitch historical intelligibility, the impulse to historicize, etc. And I feel uh, the problem perhaps is really about uh, how we conceive experience, the category of experience. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, do we think about experiences uh, a property that belongs to an individual subject who has undergone an experience? Yeah. Or do we see it as a kind of a site of instability and um, uh, irregular intensities in which the individual comes to be produced at some points, but not all the time? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I thought about it uh, uh, I, I was made forced to think about it a bit more when I realized that in Fanon, for instance, you know, the, uh, in, um, uh, in the essay called The Fact of Blackness. Right, right, yes. Uh, the original French title is The Lived Experience of the Black. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, it's interesting you know, because lived experience really there it's not really about uh, an authenticity uh, which a narration can actually claim on the basis of having uh, possessed that experience. Yeah? Mm -hmm. in, it, in other words, it's not like the indication of a special status of the speaking subject in relationship to the contents of what it is speaking about. If you look at that essay, it, it, it looks more like a kind of diagram of uh, if a diagram of a set of forces in a field, yeah? And that diagram actually tells you the impossibility of being black, yeah? Mm -hmm. Its relationship to the person of the gaze, you know? This is what is called the lived experience, yeah? You know, it's, it's an interesting point to think about, yeah? So, so I would say that uh, my, uh, my own inclination is to think about experience uh, not really in positive or substantial terms, but uh, 
as a kind of space of variations of intensity, which is not stable, which you cannot really persist or contain, you know, like the way in which you speak about an object which you possess as a property. Yeah? Now, uh, the way I see uh, the critique of experience, which is also made by um, philosophers uh, and uh, uh, cultural theorists, as I see it as a critique of the mechanisms uh, by which the radical potential of the concept of experience gets constrained by a template of liberal politics. Yeah? Quite so. so. Which converts experience into something which can be possessed by a subject and meet links on the basis of that possession. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so it is possible to read uh, the critique of the authenticity of experience, uh, not necessarily from the point of view of a project of historicization, but from this point of view, which actually tries to prevent it from getting showed up as some kind of property. Yeah. Right, right. And I would think that quite a bit of the, the more recent work in feminist theory, queer theory, and of course, uh, very prominently in uh, uh, black studies and Dalit studies, you know, black thought and Dalit thought uh, is, is moving in this direction. I'm thinking in particular of, uh, uh, of course, Ashil Mbembe's work has been very, very important, especially his more recent work is absolutely central there. And, and the work of Fred Morton, you know, Fred Morton's right. work is very yeah. important. And, uh, and uh, then uh, I was particularly, uh, 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 persuaded by some of the questions opened up in the work of people like Heather Love, mm -hmm. looking, feeling backward. Yeah. Right, and, yeah. And then in the Indian context, definitely Gopal's work, you know, and some Gopal Guru's work has actually uh, brought up many of these questions. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, uh, alongside, you know, on the one hand, he is a political theorist, but on the other hand, his work is also uh, sensitive to this problem of, uh, uh, these intensities, which you cannot really show up. You know? uh, it's not systematic in Gopal Guru's work, but it is very provocative you know, in, sure. forms, in bringing up this kind of issue. So, so um, as I see it, you know, the question of identity, uh, identity as a category and the concept of experience, they have a kind of intimate but difficult relationship. Perfectly, huh? uh, that, that, that I think is what we need to look at more closely. And Aniket, Aniket Javare's book, uh, when he examines Dalit writing, for instance, it, what he really looks at, it, looks at is not the identity of the Dalit, but some site of destitution. Destitution, yes, yeah. Uh, and and that, there is a kind of uh, tense or difficult relationship between uh, the lens that we call destitution and the lens of identity. We're looking at this. Mm -hmm. so, so that interests me very much. Right. So the, to prevent experience from becoming too easily a currency of liberal representational yes. politics. Yes. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, I, I remember when there was a discussion um, in uh, one of the journals, academic journals, about uh, Cracked Mirror, which was right. uh, yeah. written by Sun, Sundar Sarukai and Gopal Guru. Uh, in that uh, uh, discussion, uh, V. Sanil made an interesting point about the need to intensify the category of experience. Yeah, uh -huh. and I think there is something something yeah, important. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So when I say that um, uh, there is a need to prevent it from congealing as a commodity or as a property, you know. Uh, what I have in mind is something along the lines of Sanil gestures towards the of intensity, then right. that would be a step in uh, preventing it from mm -hmm. uh, being treated as uh, mm -hmm. a property on the basis mm -hmm. of which you make claims, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to take you back to your work on uh, C. Ayappan's short stories momentarily. Um, and this might sound a little 
a bit of a kind of hair splitting, but could you kind of elaborate for us uh, the, 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 the slight distinctions between affect, experience, and what you may call haunting. Uh, haunting, uh, visitation, possession, and such like. Um, so is there a thought there in terms of why, what's the interest in stories of ghosts and possessions? And where does that take us in some ways? About the, about the various uh, terms which you mentioned, uh, I must confess that uh, I'm not always uh, very invested in the precise differentiation of that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah. uh, although it does matter in certain contexts, you know, especially when you are actually um, uh, trying to make distinctions and see what is at stake in these distinctions, of course it is important, yeah? Uh, but I would say that I'm, I'm more interested in evolving a kind of flexible uh, vocabulary, a toolkit with which you can describe with uh, precision or chart with precision uh, a certain kind of situation which is presented as a subject in these stories, yeah? It, the subject is actually a certain kind of situation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that um, you mention Ayepen. Uh, what he does is he, you know, what drew me to him was uh, he uses a very interesting fictional technology for this. You know, there are there you could say that there are two kinds of stories which Ayepen has written from this point. Of, when we look at it from this point of view. One of them is what I have tried to call nighttime stories. You know, right. there, are, yeah. there are stories where people who committed suicide, they come back as spirits and they possess living people. And the stories themselves are written in the form of uh, the spirits speaking and explaining to the person who is being possessed by it, why it is there. So a kind of, you could say it's a kind of autobiography or testimony of uh, the person who is dead, yeah? On the other hand, I have been also wrote a number of stories which are, which are about uh, Dalit subjects who have actually uh, succeeded in the modern uh, liberal regime of governance and who have managed to get some kind of position in the middle class and in the uh, what you may call broadly the uh, established structures of society, yeah? And what he explores is how they are uh, constantly uh, anxious about this being undermined by situations of humiliation or situations where their caste stigma is made to shake up and destroy these structures which they have achieved. You know? mm -hmm. So you could say that uh, there is a kind of uh, constant state of precarity, uh, which, which is really about humiliation uh, in these stories. So if you, if you juxtapose these two kinds of stories, you will see that his concern is really with this instability of the subject, and that is explored through a particular situation. That situation may be one of uh, uh, the rage or grief of the spirit, but it can also be this uh, uh, anxiety about uh, precarity and humiliation, yeah? In both these cases, it is difficult to understand it in terms of a kind of coherent subject because these are precisely the emotions which you cannot really understand in terms of a subject which is self-contained, which can make itself an object of reflection, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the ghost stories, uh, uh, interest me particularly, uh, and more recently I have been more interested in them. Here I have also been uh, uh, inspired by some inquiries in more recent anthropology, like like the work of Kalpana Ram, yes, to which uh, I, uh, you know we had a discussion at CSBS mm -hmm. once, uh, 
what I really liked about Kalpana Ram's study is that it looks at spirit possession as a kind of mode of witnessing that, that uh, the person who is possessed is actually allowing herself uh, to become a kind of uh, space for housing the memory of unjust deaths within right. the social space, yeah? So uh, this of course opens, according to me, a new way of um, thinking about aspects of our own historical existence. You know? What is actually the, the historical existence of somebody living in the present? And uh, uh, there it is not merely about what can be avowed as memory, but also what cannot be avowed as memory, where you do not really become the subject of recollection, but you become more like uh, a space which houses within itself uh, memories which cannot be avowed in the social space or in public. You know? This kind of situation of the subject where it is uh, broken or opened up, mm. uh, as a mode of historical existence that interests me very much. And here, uh, I don't think my work on Ayyapan would have moved forward, but for the work of uh, scholars like Sanel Mohan, you know, uh, who have actually uh, looked at practices of commemoration, which really operate at the level of uh, emotions, uh, like lamentation, prayer, et cetera, et cetera. You know? so, so to return uh, to the question, uh, uh, more than a kind of differentiation of this, uh, the concept of effect in relationship to emotion, feeling, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I am interested in that spectrum and how these this field of intensity seems to rupture the stable subject and open up the space of the individual for uh, a set of circuits which actually go mm. beyond it, go outside it. So that immediately makes me want to ask about the contemporary moment of the pandemic and the viral and the openness of the human body. And here we, we are going from the self and the subject to the idea of the body and its permeability. So is there, is there something to think here uh, in terms of the question of permeability of the subject? And it's becoming a house, as it were, of diverse life and non-life forms, from ghosts to the virus, as it were. Uh, is there something there that, that can push forward and, in, and take in a different direction uh, what we know as affect theory? Thank you. Yeah, I, I haven't uh, thought about this enough, you know, because uh, uh, probably we are still living through something which we haven't fully, fully yeah, sure. I, I um, spoke once about uh, being alone and being together, which, which had become a kind of uh, uh, yes. uh, concern uh, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, and one of the things which I uh, noticed at that time, uh, when I think about it, is that <clears throat> a kind of different threshold of human life mm -hmm. uh, has got into the ambit of uh, politics as well as our uh, individual uh, ways of dealing with our everyday life. And, and this new threshold is probably not exactly the same as what we earlier understood by the concept of naked life or bare life, like in Agamben and uh, thinkers of that kind. Here, it is more about the status of the human being as an organism, mm -hmm. not really as a, a body, mm -hmm. but as an organism. And uh, there, uh, the word permeability, of course, has a different kind of dimension. You know, it's really about uh, uh, an organism's outer contours. You know, the skin really becomes uh, the outer contour of the organism. The, the concept of touch begins to change there. It is not quite the same as what we were familiar with in earlier ways of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, so this is something which uh, we 
need to understand more. more. And I wondered if looking at this uh, organismic dimension, which has been brought forward, so to say, as a site of the political and as a site of the individual's engagement with everyday life, whether that would help us understand not merely these technologies of disciplining, but a certain kind of indifference, which is also created in situations of the pandemic. Indifference as a mode of existence, you know, a mode of uh, 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 justified existence, which is at the limits of what we understand as morality. Right. But it also has generated new kinds of ethical gestures, difficult ethical acts, like how do you stand with somebody mm -hmm. whom you cannot access? Yeah, uh, We know about COVID deaths and uh, uh, the inability to mourn, inability to have any rituals. We also know that this is in some sense paralleled by the situation of the uh, family and uh, uh, friends of disappeared people or people in jails, yeah? So there is probably a set of uh, uh, affective situations which we may be able to look at more closely and with greater precision uh, when uh, we take into account this uh, new kind of uh, model of the organism which becomes an important concern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, a last question, somewhat connected, but perhaps not entirely. Uh, what about the relationship between uh, what you are so precisely calling the, calling the orgas, uh, or, or organismic, uh, uh, the, the, the pre-human in, in its kind of being as, as a body, the sensory, which is in some senses, there's a long philosophical history yeah. of the senses and the sensory as part of both the ontology and the epistemology of being human and what we are now calling affective. Um, so does, do we now think of what we understand as aesthetics, if aesthetics has to do with the arrangements of senses in terms of what we hear or see or feel, uh, uh, the five uh, kind of sensory uh, uh, impacts that we feel on ourselves. Do we, do we rethink aesthetics itself uh, in our contemporary moment uh, from both the direction of the affective and let's call it the viral uh, as, as a kind of metonym for the experience that we are going through now? Uh, I, I do not really know about the... Uh, the, the level of the organism and uh, the level of the viral pandemic in relationship to this question. Uh, but definitely there is, a, uh, there, is a, there is a kind of reorientation of the aesthetic. Probably it's an intensification, a deepening, um, uh, because as you correctly say, the idea of the aesthetic in modern times when it emerged, it had a certain clear relationship with what uh, philosophers call sensibility. Yeah? Our capacity to receive sensory uh, experiences. Yeah? But at the same time, it was also important this, that the sensibility be part of a set of faculties, like in Kant, uh, right. which includes reason, you know, uh, and the aesthetic is impossible in Kant uh, if uh, you do not have uh, uh, if the faculty of reason is unavailable, you know, the sun, yeah? which is why uh, he has the argument that uh, the savage people do not have an experience of the sublime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, mm -hmm. yeah? uh, this has been um, uh, a point of a lot of uh, critical uh, revisiting uh, in recent times. You know, we, we know that. Uh, it, the the question, see. When we speak about reason, we are really speaking about the domain of the moral, the domain of the political, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in the absence of the capacity for politics, you cannot really have uh, an aesthetic, aesthetic deployment of 
sensory experience. And that, that is the kind of thrust. But at the same time, the political is also kept out in the sense that what you have in aesthetics uh, in the early elaboration of this is an idea of form without any deployment of force, without any deployment of constraint. So you get the idea of harmony, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this, of course, this has been rethought in our own times by many thinkers who have tried to suggest that, uh, like Rancière, for instance, democracy is really the, uh, the mode in which something like literature exists. So the politics of literature really is the politics of the mode of existence of literary mm. practice or literature as a, mm. as a kind of uh, 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 entity. And, and that he associates with the, quest, uh, the, the idea of democracy, which is about equality, et cetera, et cetera, or lack of qualification, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Mm. But uh, we also know that this earlier aesthetic frame created a peculiar situation where politics is on the one hand seen as outside the world of the aesthetic, but on the other hand, it is also seen as the secret of the aesthetic in the sense that the aesthetic artifact is seen as hiding within it like a secret, some kind of articulation or response to politics. So you, we try to think about works of art as allegories of the political or uh, resolutions, imaginary resolutions of the political, et cetera, et cetera. Probably it is this, uh, this way of looking at things which is under some strain and some challenge in our times when we probably need to take the discussion to a kind of lower threshold of our political subjectivity, not really the level of uh, 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 rational autonomy, mm -hmm. but that of dispositions, mm -hmm. that of uh, permeability, etc., etc., and there probably more than the idea of sensibility and uh, uh, senses, it might be a word like sensation, which might become more important. Quite right. Sensation yeah. Yeah. Both, uh, uh, mm -hmm. indicates a uh, less formed uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, field of charge and intensity rather than something which, which can be kind of arranged. Mm -hmm. in a certain way, you know, in the senses. So that is probably uh, where this discussion uh, is turning towards in our times. And I see the preoccupation, for instance, with uh, uh, stigma or unaccommodatable existences. You know, these is very important. They point towards a kind of domain of what one, one may call political existence as different from political life. Life, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, concepts like destitution are an attempt to reach that threshold, I think. Yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's so pr precisely put, beautifully put indeed. Uh, as ever, it has been a great pleasure. Uday, thank you for speaking to us and thank you for answering, giving so much attention to each of these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you for you. listening. Mm -hmm.